All right. All right. Welcome back, guys. This is Stumbling Forward. I am one of your co-hosts, Kristen Herman. And I'm Monica Ortega. Awesome. And today we're actually speaking to Ryan Yamashita. Ryan is an LA native community builder, doer, and connector. He currently works as an assistant director of alumni engagement at his alma mater, LMU, Loyola Marymount University. He's an active volunteer with many different surf skate organizations, including Youth Mentoring Connections, Surfside LA, Life Rolls On, and Boards for Bros. And through those, he's able to share his passion and love of the outdoors with others and help make those spaces more inclusive and welcoming. Like many of us, he's leveraged the down time of the pandemic to pursue a new side hobby, launching his own resin art business, and is now creating ocean resin art on the side to bring a little piece of the ocean to others' homes. Thanks for being on the show, Ryan. How are you doing today? Good. Thanks so much for having me, guys. I had, what an honor. Yeah. <laughs> I'm stumbling forward podcast. Never thought this would happen. <laughs> what? You didn't think this is going to happen? Are you kidding? You Ryan's one of those guys we both knew. To bring you on. <laughs> yeah, we had to bring on and we were just like I just love the the resin art and I saw it everywhere and it's like how about just tell us a little bit about you and your job now and then why resin art yeah so I think let's take a step back the the pandemic pre-pandemic Ryan um was I think I would just go in probably 200 miles per hour every weekend was jam-packed volunteering with a different org or finding some way to get people to the beach and just, I, I love building community where I can and driving connections. And a lot of that was lost um, during the pandemic. I think somebody gave a stat the other day where day 400 something working from home, which is nuts. Um, and so I, I had to find a way to one, just fill the time, keep myself home. We, I live in LA. And as you know, we've had some of the highest cases and some of the uh, worst issues with COVID, but um I started leaning hard into art with like a lot of other people did. I had wanted to learn how to do resin art for a while. I'd seen it on Instagram and finally, I think Monica knows this. I I'm, consider myself a doer. So instead of just sitting there waiting, I just, it's like, how do I sign up for a class? How do I start learning this? And it's definitely been a great way to keep me home and um, learning something fun and new. Yeah. So you started it just for fun, but like, what is it turned in? Like, did you plan on selling them or was this just something for you? And then you had people asking, how did that turn into ocean? What is it? Ocean resin art? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I think I, I kind of lead by how my dad likes to live life of set intentions, not expectations. And so really I set this intention that I wanted to go and learn this new skill. Um, and I always like to have fail safes or fallback. So even if I didn't, let's say I sucked at this, at the very least, I could still make these ornaments, um, give it to my mom for Christmas, and she'd still be happy. But I always like to have other pathways and doors still open for next steps that, um, you know, I, I consider myself to be entrepreneurial and creative. And if that did blossom into something else, I definitely have had past experiences where, that I could leverage and build into something fun to make these pieces for others. Yeah. So when did it become like, people were like, okay, you're, you're pretty good at this, Ryan. I think that, uh, I think you should probably market it. When was that? Yeah, I, I think it took a leap of faith from, from one of my really good friends, Stacy. She actually has her own podcast as well. It's called the Salted Spirit Podcast. And she's just been one of my biggest supporters. Uh, she, her podcast is all about supporting water women, uh, whether they're kayakers, scuba divers, surfers. Mermaids. Mermaids. Sorry, I, who said I know that? you guys had a, you had a <laughs> professional mermaid on your guys' podcast, right? I w we want to. I would love oh, to have yeah. a professional mermaid. <laughs> um, but she she reached out. She had seen the pieces I made for my mom for uh, through that class, ornament making class, and she was like, "Hey, Rye, I don't know if you're looking to make." something but would love to order some coasters and totally cool if you're not taking orders but uh she hosts these live tea sessions um and so and because she works with water people or water women what better than this ocean coaster for for tea sessions and from there i got my first order and then people saw i was taking orders and just sort of snowballed from there that's, that's so awesome cool. how long does it take to make one you know resin is tough it Really, depending on what brand or uh, what type you're using, the type I use is Moss Epoxy's Tabletop Pro, and it's only a 30-minute work time. So you, after you mix part A, which is the resin, with part B, the hardener, 
your time, your clock starts ticking and you have to mix it up and then you have about 30 minutes to pour it, work it how you want. Otherwise it starts curing and hardening. And at that point you just have to kind of leave it. Um, wow. It's very easy overwork. It's also very easy to um, get over consumed. So I've learned to just trust the process and, and let go yeah. a little bit more. So I don't know much about resin. Is it also with paint? So you put paint on the bottom and then you put the resin on top and it kind of blends and bleeds or? Yeah. So there's a couple different approaches. And I know I've gone to connect with many different resin artists um, after launching this. I became a part of this community called the Maker Meetup. And uh, it's fun to see the different styles. Um, some will lay down spray paint ahead of time uh, with sand effects or just the blues and greens and then lay a clear layer epoxy resin over, over it. For me, um, I like to mix in my pigments. And so there's a couple of ways you could do that. You could use mica powder, you could use alcohol inks or even these tints that I use from Mixel. Um, and Mixel has these concentrated colors. You could, I think you could use acrylic paint as well. So you mix that together with the resin and it tints it. That's awesome. Mm. I feel like you should, I don't know if it's like super hard to do tiny, but I'm like, I want a necklace with that or like earrings with that. Like yeah. that would be so cool. I feel like there's so many that things would be cool. you could do now that you have like the process down. Yeah. So there's actually a, a ton of amazing jewelry makers I have gone to connect with some that will make those necklaces or rings or even like pop sockets for phones. Oh, uh, yeah. And I've even seen connected with a couple artists that use microplastics in their jewelry. So they'll go do beach cleanups and then do these beautiful earrings or necklaces. Um, personally, it's, it's funny. You'd think smaller surfaces might be easier to work with, but because resin so easy to overwork, the smaller surfaces, you almost have to just hit it with your heat gun real quickly and leave and they it. they dry quick, right? Yep. The, the smaller surfaces. And then, but the bigger surfaces, they're actually easier to work with. Um, and you have more surface area to play around with. And so it's, it's, it's interesting. It's a huge, I would buy that table. <laughs> It'd be so expensive. <laughs> it, it's An $8,000 yeah. table. I'd be like, I'll take it. It's going to go right in that little <laughs> corner. <laughs> I, there, I, there's some artists I follow, um, like Ronnie Langley. She makes these beautiful tables and those sell for like 1500 to 2000 yeah. plus dollars. And I, it's unbelievable how they're able to work with that larger surfaces. And sometimes you do need two people because the work time's so short, you need one person pouring, then the other using the heat gun um, to yeah. then work the lacing and cells. So I was thinking that the other day when I, I saw that you were doing a little ocean cleanup for plastic, um, you would never want to use recyclable material in your product? So the, the tough part, uh, as you kind of mentioned earlier, I'm involved in a lot of different surf organizations, yeah. especially Surf Rider LA, and their whole focus is the protection and enjoyment of our oceans, waves, and beaches, and that if we're going to go surfing, we have to take care of it so we can continue to do what we love. Um, Resin art in itself can be very wasteful. Uh, if you're not measuring it correctly, you could over pour and have a lot of excess resin drips underneath. Uh, a lot of us use plastic cups or disposable stirring sticks, disposable gloves, just to do a few, you know, few pieces. And so I've been consulting with this one um, ocean friendly marketplace group called the Sea Blue Collective. And they've been helping me find ways to make my business more sustainable using silicone mixing cups, silicone mixing sticks, mats, um, how to, my shipping is actually all 100% carbon neutral shipping through Sendal. So, and then a uh, portion of my proceeds actually go back towards Surfrider LA. So then that way, even though some of my stuff might not be perfect, at least I'm able to help fund an org that really is making a difference and impact and keep giving back to what gives me inspiration for my ocean art. Yeah, that's Amazing. awesome. So you're still working at LMU. Is that full-time then that you still have your day job? Yes. Yeah. So I'm still working full-time at LMU. Absolutely love it. Um, it's funny. I think they, it's for New Year's, they came out, no, the Super Bowl. There's uh, the Dolly Parton song that normally it's nine to five. They came out with another version for Squarespace called Your Five to Nine. And it's an amazing <laughs> ad where you see them just working at their desk, doing their day job, and the clock hits five o'clock. They rip off their work clothes. They're all in like colorful, uh, whatever side hustle job clothing they're in, and they're launching their mm -hmm. websites, doing everything 
So oh my, gosh. my days have not gotten shorter. They're definitely nine <laughs> to five is LMU. And then five to nine is re- responding to DMs, processing orders, doing resin art in the evening, sometimes until like one in the morning. What is that That's balance crazy. like? Uh, it's, it's interesting. You would think working those longer hours would make things more stressful, but art in and of itself is therapy. And so being able to put on a good podcast, like the Stumbling Forward podcast or some good music um, definitely helps pass the time while pouring resin and uh, just get into that zone to decompress after work and take my mind off things. Especially that's like, so great. Yeah. I such a hustle and like, that's awesome. Just like inspirational, just be like, okay, you know, I have this job and then I'm going to be like focusing on another. Um, and also something that's so like, you're trying to make sustainable as well as you're donating. So that's amazing. Where did you go to school for at LMU? Like what was your, your major? Yeah. So it's sort of a unique major. I studied entrepreneurship while I was at LMU. Um, And that really, I think, helped set the entrepreneurial mindset and gave me a strong foundation of how to just be creative with things. I I don't necessarily consider myself an entrepreneur. I've always considered myself more of an intrapreneur, um, being within a business or an org, utilizing the pre-existing resources and then using that entrepreneurial mindset to then create new sort of departments and uh, programs. That's an awesome way to think about it. Yeah, I've never been an entrepreneur, but it makes sense because not everybody wants to wear every single hat, but I think it is important to have that entrepreneur mindset. I wish they would have taught that when I was in school. I'm aging myself. (laughs) Back in my (laughs) day. day. They never said this. (laughs) (laughs) Um, With uh, surfing, and I know that you have like surf and skate and you're involved in a lot of different organizations. Uh, when did you start surfing? When did you, like, was that like young age? Yeah, so I, you know, I was really fortunate to pick it up at a young age. It's, I, I grew up down in Palos Verdes and it's funny cause I felt like I started late. Everybody down there probably starts when they're like five years old and could even go in the water. Um, and I think growing up, I was called a kook for starting. I didn't start to like eighth grade and was treated like, oh, you don't know what you're doing. Whereas once you get to college, you realize you're meeting all these people from out of state or even those that grew up in LA that have never touched a surfboard and starting when you're 15 is actually like a pretty, still a pretty young age. And so thankfully I've been surfing for about half my life now, 15 years. <laughs> wow. Nice. I've been twice. I failed miserably. <laughs> I've never been and it's on my list. It's on my list. I don't know how well I'll do. I have been on a snowboard but that's probably nothing like a surfboard, <laughs> I'm assuming. You're not strapped in, so I'll no. probably fall. <laughs> yep, yep, but so what one day. Think, what do you think were some lessons that maybe you learned by you know, not really preparing on this being a second business and it turning into one? What are maybe some mistakes that you made along the way that you wanna share to help other people? I think you know, thankfully, this wasn't my first venture. Um, in college, I did actually senior year of high school. I This is going to sound really SoCal LA, but I got to take a surfboard chafing class. And so we got to make two surfboards and one skateboard during that. Um, and a bunch of my friends who were going off to college tried my skateboard that I shaped and asked, they're like, hey, can you make me a, a board for college? And I took my birthday money, I bought 20 blanks, started taking orders and built my own apparel line and everything with it. Uh, And that actually, as I like to joke, paid for beer and gas in college um, and really set me in knowing that, hey, entrepreneurship is a good fit for my major. Um, And so with that and like the lessons learned through those five, six years or so of doing that, I think I was able to process and carry those into what I was doing here. I also came in with better expectations, I think, and and safeguards for myself. One thing I didn't know when running my skateboard business was how sometimes it can grow a lot bigger than you want it to. And it just becomes a job in an order. And that's something I started getting burnt out on. It started off as being something that was special. It was a gift that really made someone smile. Um, there's this feeling I had when standing on a skateboard and it was rolling, knowing I made this, I'm the only one with this and like, this is so cool. And so I wanted to share that with others and make sure they were a part of the process. But as it extended beyond just friends and friends of friends or people just finding me through my website, people like, I I don't have time for a phone call. Do you have templates? Um, when can I expect this turnaround? 
and some of them were other students and say, hey, we're, we're also in like, we're both in midterms right now. I don't have time to, to shape. And so it lost its personalization um, and started becoming a stressor rather than um, a decompressor. And so I wanted to make sure I put those safeguards with this that I didn't expand myself too quickly um, as, as an artist or a creator or a maker, you're not running, you're running a business, but you also are the business. Mm -hmm. And until you move yourself into more of that CEO position, you're hiring on people to make the pieces for you. You can only expand and scale so much. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a lesson I brought into it. I also, I think, started getting a little worried about liability when I was running my skateboard business, um, that if somebody broke an ankle or fell off that, when I was looking into general liability and product liability insurance, I was not making the type of revenue to afford that yeah. for just a fun side hobby. And the, the risk it opened me up to wasn't worth it. So I stopped shaping. Um, mm -hmm. And so with this, I want to make sure whatever I made was decorative is functional art, but didn't had like zero to no risk. And so I see a lot of people that make charcuterie boards or cutting boards and there's still a lot that's unknown about resin and food safety with that and so rather than just saying hey yes that would look beautiful but then feel terrible if I made somebody sick I just have drawn the line and said no anything that could potentially touch food I'm, I'm not going to be doing that's really smart. That's so smart so let's say it does grow and keep growing bigger and bigger and bigger. Is this something that you would want to do full time, or would you stop it as well because you want to keep it as a hobby? Or in the side, uh, the, the latter. And I think people have asked, so like, hey Ryan, you have amazing connections. You have a lot of drive and ideas for where you can build this. Like, I think that you could turn this into a full time gig. And I have openly shared that, that is actually not an aspiration of mine. Um, I want this to continue to be something fun and special. But uh, while I know there's this perception of the starving artist, that's, that's actually false. I know so many artists that do this full time and they're making more money probably than I am um, by selling these $2,000 plus tables and just having this great community and following where they do their relaunches or restocks at the beginning of the month and they're sold out within like two hours. Oh um, but with that um, being said, I don't want that this to be, if I don't get this order and I need to be marketing and selling and, and really hustling, I won't have a roof over my head next month or I won't have uh, food on my plate. I'm, I'm tired of PB and J sandwiches and cup of noodles and, uh, versus I love my job at LMU. It took about seven years of navigating post-grad and changing industries and jobs to finally find a good fit like it that it's steady, it's something that's fulfilling, that I'd rather have that as a steady paycheck and benefits and use this as supplemental income and just a, a de-stressor. I love that because I, I feel like so many times, especially in today's society, because entrepreneurship is like super cool, that people find something, they're like, I can make money at this. And then they just want to go all in on it and they quit too soon so or they don't realize that maybe it's not something that they wanted to do full-time so I think that that's really important that you are very self-aware of what you want this to become I think that's important and I wonder is it because is it how do you how do you draw that line how do you like like you know you love doing this and you're going to keep doing it is it about saying no like I'm I have it's just about saying that like having, um, I already have my schedule and, and I don't have time for this other art or, or this other order. I mean, I would say that's probably something that I'm going to hit and have a lot of trouble with. Um, I'm, I'm definitely sort of that people, people pleaser sort of personality, or I, I want to say yes and, and spread that joy or make something special for people. But I, I think through the years and all the different jobs or seeing the parts where you start dropping the ball on things, I've learned to not overcommit and under deliver. And that's easier. It's better to say no than yes and not be able to fulfill it. Exactly. Um, or feel like you're rushed or not enjoying it. Like you said, yep. yeah, that's crazy. Well, I mean, like, it's just such a beautiful piece, honestly, like, would you ever want to do something else besides ocean or would you think that um, it's like, it's just something that you enjoy just making that one specific design yeah, so I think there's a lot of different directions that you and think amazing things you can do with resin. Um, one of our Maker Meetup hosts, Annie, she's 
known for making all of her domino sets, making these pyramids and uh, making all the even like chess piece, chess boards, chess pieces, things like that, that cool. I even last week, um, one of my friends asked me if I could make her some um, Dungeons and Dragons, um, 20 sided dice. Um, oh, ni- dice nice. For her. Yes. So I think it's, there's a lot of things I could do, but it's important to really focus on that specialty and niche. Um, there's so many other ocean resin artists out there that when I can't tell you how many of hundreds of accounts I follow and they follow me back where our accounts pretty much all look the same. So it's important to be able to one, have a focus, but also differentiate yourself. If you're doing every kind of resin under the sun, it, people yeah. won't know what your strengths are. Um, I totally agree. That's awesome. So where can people find um, the ocean resin art and where can they find you? Yeah. So currently I'm, I'm just on Instagram. Um, I am, eventually going to be working on building out my own website so you can see my pieces there and build out a blog as the, so you could follow along with my journey uh, building this out and seeing hearing more about my mistakes or why I decided to not go a certain route but um, currently I'm on Instagram it's ry ry dot ocean resin art and um, not probably won't be on TikTok so sorry no dances or anything. <laughs> I mean, if you put like a TikTok, like making of it, you know, that would be pretty cool. But yeah, yeah. I'm not on TikTok, so I don't know. Or Etsy and sell them on Etsy, but then it blows up. Yeah, (laughs) that does blow up usually. That actually has been um, something where people have asked like, why aren't you on Etsy yet? Like you should, you could be doing so many orders, but this is thankfully a good problem to have. I've had a pretty steady flow of orders from, from friends and other supporters that, thankfully I'm already at my cap that I have told friends, I don't want to open up those floodgates to, I think I can scale it by doing those steps. But right now, if I open up that channel, I won't be able to fulfill orders on time. Yeah. That makes sense. Oh, this is so cool. And you guys have to see it. Like you have to go to his Instagram and see it. Cause this is the one thing about like an audio platform. And you can watch watch the video and see it. (laughs) Yeah, I was going to say, I could could like hold a a couple foot. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I like the bottle opener. I think I need to get one of those for myself. Just because it's so cool. (laughs) Can you make like a mouse pad? Like a, like a (laughs) mouse. Like I want the, I just want the whole mouse to just be. That would actually be. My whole room. Yeah. You want me to do a resin wall? Yeah. wall. Thank oh you. God, you have to go from the ceiling and then like hurry up and like heat it on the way down. You got 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's not off topic. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on. Again, you guys have to check out his Instagram. If you want to see it, watch the video on YouTube as well. If you are listening to this, please give us five stars, leave us a review, all of that good stuff. And uh, I'm Monica Ortega, one of your hosts. And I'm Kristen Herman. And thank you, Ryan. We will see you guys later. Yeah, thank you guys.